In this episode of Between the Lines, IDS Director of Research Peter Taylor interviews IDS Research Fellows Danny Burns and Joe Howard and Sonia M. Ospina, Professor of Public Management and Policy at the NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. They edited the recently published SAGE Handbook of Participatory Research and Inquiry. The handbook offers an overview of different influences on participatory research, explores in detail how to address critical issues and design effective participatory research processes, and provides detailed accounts on how to use a wide range of participatory research methods. Okay, well, hello and welcome to another edition of IDS's podcast series, Between the Lines, where we have the opportunity to find out more about the background of an important publication from the authors themselves. Uh, my name is Peter Taylor and I'm Director of Research at IDS. And today we're going to talk about a really exciting new publication that I'm particularly thrilled about because I believe it's going to speak to the interests of a really wide range of researchers, practitioners, and that very interesting eclectic community who sometimes are known as Pracademics. And it's the first ever SAGE Handbook of Participatory Research and Inquiry. And according to its overview, it aims to provide the most comprehensive source of contemporary cutting edge approaches to participatory research methods and design, as well as the foundations of participatory research and critical practice issues. Now, participatory research has a really long history. It's been very important to the life and work of IDS, and we've been fortunate to have many examples of leaders in the field, and we've participated in many, many partnerships and collaborations in different contexts over several decades. And we know that the participatory research community is very extensive, and their work over the past 20 years has contributed to a critical mass of knowledge, which I think is reflected in this new publication. Many would argue that participatory research has never been more relevant than it is today, because it helps to address the universal challenges that we're all facing, and to help understand these complex challenges, build solidarity and affect change. So today, I'm delighted to be in conversation with the co-editors of the book, Danny Burns, Joe Howard, and Sonia Ospina. We're gonna hear their personal reflections on what this new SAGE Handbook of Participatory Research and Inquiry explores in depth through its many examples and contributions, why participatory methods are needed, who they benefit, and more about the real world context they apply to. So just to introduce our speakers today, Danny Burns is a research professor and he's worked at IDS since 2010. He was leader of the participation, inclusion and social change team for nine years. Before that was co-director of SOLAR at the University of the West of England. And Danny has directed more than 25 participatory action research programs, including currently as director of the Child Labour Action Research Innovation in South and Southeast Asia program, Clarissa, which works on the worst forms of child labour. And his work has focused over many years on how to build deeply participatory and systemic processes at scale. And he's authored several books, articles and research papers on these issues. Jo Howard is also a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies and she leads the IDS Participation, Inclusion and Social Change Research Cluster. Her work focuses on social inclusion, the intersection of inequalities, governance, power participation and accountability. In, in her work, she uses participatory action research methods with community groups to promote and support processes of accountability, empowerment, citizenship and inclusion. She also convenes short courses and tailored learning processes with NGOs, international NGOs and government departments enabling them to use participatory approaches, reflective practice, and increased knowledge exchange. And she's also the author of many publications on these issues. And thirdly, I'm delighted to welcome Sonia Ospina, Professor of Public Management and Policy at the NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. She's a sociologist by training and an expert in qualitative and participatory research. Her interest in dynamics of democratic governance has motivated research on social change leadership, social innovation and public accountability in various geographical settings. She's presently working with indigenous women leaders in Colombia to support their leadership and develop insights about collective leadership. And she's also the author of many publications relevant to our conversation today. So welcome to you all. So I'd like to open the conversation first by asking Danny, why this book, why does it matter? Well, um, I think it, it matters anyway, but it matters particularly at this time, perhaps in the way that you suggested, where we're facing deep, deep crises of um, an interlinked type. So we're talking about climate change, we're talking about conflict, we're talking about poverty, we're talking about pandemics, 
and they're all interconnected. And we need the research tools, uh, we need the process tools to be able to engage with them. A lot of traditional research is very good at uh, establishing whether a drug works or not, but it's actually very poor at, at trying to understand complex situations like this. So, um, you know, we're in a situation where our, our world is literally facing an existential crisis. <laughs> Um, and if we don't get our act together quickly, um, then we might not have an act to get together. So um, from my perspective, this is about drawing together all of that knowledge that's been developed over 50 years that produces a really robust um, alternate form of research, which values multiple ways of knowing, that engages with those people who are most affected by the issues that we're concerned with so that we can see them together in a systemic way. And that's action orientated and allows us to learn from real action on the ground. Um, and, and enables us to sort of develop strategies iteratively rather than developing plans which are just out of date uh, as soon as they're written. So, I mean, that's just some thinking really. I mean, um, you know, Sonia, you might have something to add to this. Well, we wanted to make sure that we had um, experiences from lots of parts of the world. And so um, that's also important. Why, why that now? Uh, because, you know, this globalized world, interdependent world, it is very important to learn from lots of different places with very, very different contexts. And so that I think is, is, is an important part of the why. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sonia and Danny. And Joe, can you say a bit about why participatory research in particular? What is it about it that now is of high value to equip researchers and practitioners with more knowledge and understanding of this field? Well, what I might add to that is, the, is that participatory research um, focuses us on the process and the relationships. And so it brings ethics into the frame and throughout the process rather than a, a checklist at the beginning of your research. And I think through doing that, it builds, helps us to build better relationships through the research that we do that can um, build the confidence and the relationships for action. And also in a world of divisions and inequalities, building those relationships is absolutely paramount. And um, both in terms of doing good work and beginning to address the inequalities that are in the world around us. Great, Thank thanks. Sonia, can you say a bit more about what, what are the issues that the book addresses? You know, what's, what's in there? Sure, first of all, we have 71 chapters, which is a, a lot of them, and we've divided them into two different volumes. A first volume that tends to be more conceptual, more about the big issues and the, the why uh, this is important right now. Uh, what are the challenges and the foundations that uh, participatory research uh, has? And uh, what are the critical issues that practitioners of participatory research are dealing with and the critiques that, um, that are out there and how, do, how are they being addressed by, uh, by people who are doing the work on the ground? Um, in this first, and then we move very quickly uh, into uh, tools section, right? Methods and tools section, which is the second half of the book. We start that second half of the book uh, with looking at some methods that are very much um, at the core of uh, participatory action research, which include, you know, like the whole issue of dialogic and deliberative processes and the importance of dialogue. So there's a section on that and also the digital technologies in participatory research that ends volume one. So we've started with the bigger issues then move directly to the tools. And then volume two, which um, uh, continues with the tools and methods is um, has the several additional big sections, which include an action-oriented forms of participatory research, um, the visual and performative methods, participatory monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And uh, we end with mixing and, and mashing participatory and other research methods, which is something that's happening more and more. And what I would say about the, the methods and tools part of the book is that we really wanted to get people who read these to say, okay, I can do this. Here, is, here are the big assumptions uh, that are holding this particular methodology. And then for each of those, and, and how, do, how do, do those assumptions get to be implemented in practice? Here is a step-by-step -step process 
explaining what's the logic using a very particular, one particular example that unpacks um, the specific steps by steps, not in a formulaic way. We were very careful uh, in our uh, editing work to remind people that participatory action research is not about formulas. It really is about finding your way with, with very important philosophical and um, epistemological assumptions and then becoming systematic about the work so that it is actually, it does follow some of the basic rules of, of the public work of doing research while at the same time keeping very, very grounded to the um, assumptions and respect for the people with, with which the researchers themselves and work are working or with the core researchers, I would say. Thanks, Sonia. In uh, two volumes, it's, it's quite a quite an achievement to bring all this together. Uh, Danny, uh, clearly the, the how-to material is a very important element. Can you tell us a bit more about that from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you've said, there's been a long tradition of, of uh, writing on participatory research. Um, in fact, I think what, one of the things that the book uh, represents is the fact that since that, um, there's also been a huge explosion of research methods, which perhaps has been less well um, written up to date. But I think, you know, certainly from a personal experience, I've read many of those books and come away feeling really inspired and then thinking, now what do I do? <laughs> Um, because they give case studies, but they don't give enough detail sometimes to say, I could actually do that because I know, you know, following step one, there's step two and there's step three. And again, as Sonia said, it's not formulaic, but it's really trying to understand the logic of how a, a participatory process progresses. Um, so, you know, in addition to this, if, if you like the tool part of it, there's quite a lot on design you know, what does the design of a participatory process look like? How does that evolve over time? How does that iteratively change in response to things that happen along the journey? Um, so those two things, design and, if you like, step-by-step how-to guidance have been quite central guiding principles <laughs> to us for putting this book together. Great, thanks. So you've talked about really what's in the, the book. Uh, Joe, can you tell us a little bit about what, which audiences you see this book as being important for? Who, who should take interest in this and why now? Sure, well, as Sonia has described, it's a very wide ranging um, two volume handbook and the cases and examples come from across all different sectors and engage different um, actors in, in the work. So for that reason, I think the, the book's important for you know, multiple sectors, from health and community work across to governance and peace building. It's really broad. But across all these sectors is the kind of common, con con common denominator is the need for participatory approaches um, that engage people with lived experience and value their knowledge. And this is relevant for policymakers as much as for researchers and practitioners. And, and what was the term you used, Peter? The, um, practitioners, um, academics. academics, that's the one. And um, so, you know, all of us need to learn how to work with people who are ex living and experiencing the issues that we're concerned about, value, value their knowledge and, and build knowledge with them. And so these, these are tools that um, can help people from across those different sectors uh, and areas of study to, to work. And I think also the other point is in the global north as much as the global south and their contributions from right across the globe. I mean, ju just a sort of a contemporary reflection on this issue about um, experience knowledge. I mean, we're, we're witnessing a situation in which, you know, half of the institutions in the world didn't have a clue, apparently, that the Taliban was going to take over Afghanistan when the Americans withdrew. But I think you, you probably spoke to any Afghanistan anywhere. <laughs> they would have probably told you immediately what was going to happen. <laughs> Um, because people know where they are, what's happening, what the situation is, what the power relationships are, what the context is. Um, and in that, in that particular context, you probably had every security expert, academic, policymaker, you know, whatever, you name it, they were all looking at it. But they called it wrong. And so many, um, so many examples across so many sectors, the experts are calling it wrong. And right now, in a sense, we need to see the people who are in the situation as the experts. 
Yeah, I, I would say that this uh, on the ground reality and the knowledge of the uh, on the uh, ground reality is important. And if you think about us, the editors as coming from the development field and from the po policy and public management fields, um, you, you know, these are places where, or these are domains where policymakers are trying to make decisions way up on the in the clouds uh, about realities that are happening on the ground. And in my perspective, um, this book is also for um, policymakers and public managers and development specialists who are trying to do changes in the world where um, because the, the 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 legitimate paradigm has been you know quantitative research and very uh, research that really follows a protocol where the researcher is outside of the reality that they're trying to understand, when in fact what is needed is the researcher to be completely immersed in that reality to be able to understand it, right? And so from, from our perspective, these, the, these uh, Paul, decision makers could use some understanding of, what, of how this is done and also see in the featured examples the success that, that comes from doing this kind of work. Great, right, thanks to all of you for that. So now we have a sense of why the book was written, what it's about, what's in it, and also the readership that it's aimed for, and also clearly its contem contemporary relevance as well. And I know that many of the chapters draw very much on the personal experiences of contributors. I think that's something as editors that you were really keen to draw out. Can you tell us a little bit, each of you, what stories of your own lived experience were important for you in developing this book and what influences did they have as you worked on it? So Sonia, perhaps I can turn to you first and then Joe and then Danny. Yes, um, for about 10 to 15 years, uh, we've been working here in the United States uh, with uh, social change leaders who are working or in, in uh, organizations that are really um, created to change and challenge the basic structures in the neighborhoods and in the places where they're located. And uh, in that context, um, working with these social change leaders to try to understand how the leadership they were doing happens, um, we logically had to turn to a type of research that was very much about their work and from their perspective. And so um, participatory action research was really a very important part of this of these larger um, a research agenda about social change leadership. And um, part of the issue was that um, I, you know, we had a very clear understanding of how uh, participatory action research worked and we planned for a year how to enter these communities. And as, as soon as we entered, we were engaged with the reality of, oh, academia out there, you, you know, um, you don't know what we're talking about. You're only going to come here and extract from us what's um, helpful. And people had said to me early on, you know, be careful when you enter. And I'm like, oh, I know this stuff. I've done it in the past. I, I'm very respectful of people. And bam, there it was. Um, it was a big shock. We actually had to, um, you know, they, 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 they did what they do in their work. They organized and they came to us and said, okay, what are you trying to do? Why are you doing this? And we had to kind of like rethink a, a little bit how we were doing that. So that was a very um, humbling way of, of re-entering this uh, kind of work in the United States and work that I had done before in Latin America too. Um, and it made me realize how important it is to, for people to be aware of all the details, all the assumptions, all the um, elements that that, that need to be there. And when uh, Danny and Joe made the invitation for me to join them, I was very, very excited to be able to bring that shock that was at the ground of my learning experience for 10 years doing participatory research with people in communities and be able to bring the concerns that I learned about so that they, I could share them and we could share them with, with people who are trying to do this well. So that, that's my, my story, from shock to learning to development, I guess. Right, Joe. 
Yeah, thanks, Peter, for that question. Um, there's a danger I might talk for ages now, so you'll have to cut me off because I think my story goes back uh, an awfully long time. And when I think about it, it's about 30 years. And, and so when I started working in what I now recognize to be part of the Patriot Action Research, I was working with um, social movements in Central America and as, as an NGO worker, working in training and capacity building. And I didn't, um, what I did know that I found out then was I was exposed to the, the ideas and thinking of Paolo Freire and Orlando Falsporda and participatory action research, which was really zinging in Central America at that time. But I didn't know it as an academic um, uh, discipline or research uh, um, paradigm. And then um, it's through a kind of coming back to the UK um, and training in research and then working with Danny over the over more recent years, coming to IDS and then sort of starting to join up the dots and thinking, oh, OK, so what I was doing with um, community leaders back then is actually very close to what um, people are talking about in the world of participatory research and action research and I started to join up the dots and think well in IDS there's all this work going on around participatory research and P, um, PRA um, and the work going on um, that was more in Africa and Asia and thinking well there are connections here with with my experience in Latin America and sort of bringing those together in work that Danny and I were doing um, with the Participate Network, which was looking at how you bring participatory action research into processes that can bring greater accountability and, and more and, and, and voice, voice and accountability to people around the SDGs. So that was a sort of bringing it into the development world and the development research world which for me then when the opportunity to work on this book came up, it was like, okay, now here's a chance for me to really think through with these amazing people, what, how you join up those dots and what it means to, to be thinking about um, participatory approaches in, in community organizations, with social movements, with NGOs, but also with donors, with researchers, with academics and so on. And this really was a you know, fantastic opportunity to start, start doing that. Thanks, Joe. Danny. Hi, yes. Um, well, I guess like Joe's, I mean, it's been a, a long journey and it's a, it's, it's a learning journey at every step. I, I think I've been preoccupied for quite a long time with questions about, you know, can you really reach the most marginalized? Um, the people who are not literate, the people who are slaves and bonded laborers, the people who are not seen with their disabilities and so on. Um, and bring them into processes? And can you scale? Can you scale participation um, in a way that doesn't diminish it, in a way that doesn't turn it into a sort of a sludge of consultation, which so many attempts at large scale participatory processes have become? So I guess it's been a learning journey through um, trying to answer those questions. And I've been inspired along the way by multiple projects. So maybe I'll just tell you something about one, which has uh, been truly inspirational to me. And it's, it took place in Myanmar. Um, and I was working with colleagues um, alongside a local um, refugee network in Kachin in the north. Um, and within a sort of a broader rubric of peace building, we used an action research process to um, support local communities to uh, first tell their stories. And that's, that's actually a really important part of all of this process and is very much reflected in the book, story-based methodologies. Um, but to tell their stories, to analyze them together themselves, and then to think through how to build um, action research groups. But what was exciting about this process was that they identified um, three big themes. So they identified drugs as a critical issue. And that was important because none of the peace building agencies saw drugs as an issue, that was something else. It wasn't about peace and conflict, but they saw the, add the direct links and they could show them through their mapping. Um, they were interested in returning to their homes. Many people had been in refugee camps for 10 or more years and they didn't know how they could restart their lives in a sense. And they were, um, they were wanting to address issues about uh, refugee um, and IDP um, conflicts with host communities. 
So they, they created three action research groups and they drew in all sorts of different people. But just to give some examples, with the drugs one, they, they drew in drug users, ex-drug users, children in the schools. Um, they drew in teachers, pharmacists, people in the Kitchen Independence Organization, the Kitchen Independence Army, um, people in rehabilitation centers. And they built a curriculum for the schools, which was supposed to answer their concern, which was that maybe 60 or 70% of young people were addicted to opiates. Um, and that's like a really serious issue within the conflict. But they built their own curriculum, which had ownership because they created it. Um, and they had mass rallies of thousands of people around drugs and the whole agenda became built from that. Um, and similarly, um, on the issue of returning to their homes, one of the biggest issues was that their villages were mined and they didn't know how to go back. But this is a part of Myanmar where, where no external agencies can come in, no NGOs can come in. So there had been no mine risk education at all in an area which is the second highest landmined area in the world. So they created an action research group to think about how they were going to get that. And they built links with organizations in the southern part of Myanmar and they got themselves trained and then they went back as an action research group and they did the mine risk education themselves. And then the last example was with, I mean, I'm just giving you a few examples, but with um, the issue around conflict with the host communities, the action research group identified that most of the conflicts were happening with young people. So they, they decided to create a sort of a convening of young people from both communities. And what was really interesting about that was that it, it identified the issues and started to resolve those issues. But suddenly there were spin-offs emerging and youth groups started popping up across the whole of Kachin. And those youth groups created a federation and that federation started to feed voices into the Kachin Independence Organization, which then had an input into the Myanmar dialogues um, at, at a more strategic level. So what was really exciting about that was that the action research process was facilitated and supported by us to some extent, but within weeks and months it had been taken over completely so that actually the actions were even beyond our vision and beyond our imagination and the scale was beyond our what we could see. So it was about somehow trans, transferring a process from a projectized um, beginning to something which was akin to a social movement. And that's what I think creates change. And that's what's inspired me. So it's sort of keeping that, that, that thing in mind that this sort of process allows you to create change in a different sort of way, a way that projects can't do. Actually, Peter, Danny has inspired me to go back a little bit to my own story, which was a little sketchy and, and, and talk about the content of it. Because in, in that particular project, we were trying to understand how people engaged in social change um, do their work and what's and and in what way leadership helps them do that work so and therefore you know it was about social change leadership and of course it had to be done from the inside out it had to be done from the experiences that they were having with their work particularly because we were coming with with a perspective on leadership that was very very different from the traditional ways of thinking about leadership as, as um, embodied in single individuals that became heroic and did all this work. And we wanted to really capture a collective understanding of leadership, how leadership happens when people work together to try to develop an, an agenda and, and that has meaning to them, right? So it's a very different way of thinking about leadership. So, so we, we were thinking about how do we what do we need to look at in terms of their work and what do they need to look at in terms of their work and themselves in the context to be able to do this so we we organized with them uh, cooperative inquiries we did participatory ethnographies we did uh, storytelling at its max to try to to develop a lot of um, stories on the ground that would, would tell us how to do it and we engaged all in different kinds of analysis was very interesting again coming back to my story was the tension between um, the interpretations um, that were coming from the ground and us as academics committed to action research participatory action research to also be able to um, 
to draw and distill from these stories and to negotiate with them how much of us um, were doing what in the process. So a lot of issues of power were, were coming out in this, in this process. And power is a really important element that comes out throughout the entire handbook in a very, very clear way. And uh, again, it's the kinds of things that you don't think about when you come with the best intentions to do work with people. Um, and to a large extent, it's like doing, engaging in collective leadership processes. And Danny and I actually have had this conversation for over a long time about how the idea of collective leadership is very, very much embedded in the idea of participatory action research because it is about people making sense of their reality in a systematic way so that they can come up with the knowledge that informs their action. And that's really what collective leadership is about, becoming an agent of your own destiny. And actually, Sonia, I think you're picking up another theme which runs through all of the, the, the work. And there are multiple examples here, which is about different ways of doing collective analysis that in a sense, right at the heart of participatory process is the ability to make sense together and the ability to make sense from multiple perspectives and to, to have that knowledge contested and debated and opened up to the point where once you've seen the evidence and you've made sense of it, you then have ownership of it. And once you have ownership of it, then you're prepared to take action. So there's like a real link between the making sense of evidence collectively and the preparedness to take action, which then links back to that collective leadership piece. But it's, a, it's something that, that spreads its way through the book, this, this idea of collective analysis. Yeah, and that's, that's a great segue really to the next question, because clearly your own uh, life experience, your reflections, your learnings have informed your work on this book. I'm sure that's true for you know, the other contributors as well. Um, and you just described you know, some of the things that you found in, the, in the, the, the bringing together of this book. Are there any other things that uh, you feel that you particularly learned or perhaps that surprised you as you brought this book together? Joe, perhaps to start with you. Yeah, shall I kick off that? Well, <laughs> I was just thinking as, as Son Sonia was talking about how that that emphasis on power is really something that, that that came out so strongly in across the handbook, and that I guess that didn't surprise me, but it's it, it's really notable, and that, that a book that's about participatory research and research methods that that power and uh, collective action features so uh, collective analysis and collective action features so so consistently throughout. Um, and power is an issue that needs to be addressed in not only in terms of the research participants themselves, but in terms of the relationship between the researcher and the participant, between the thinking about the funder. There are various uh, chapters in the book that really make us think about how you navigate those relationships and those power relationships with funders, with um, uh, universities, in communities, between people of different religions, and so on and so forth. And I think that's been, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see all that in one place. What perhaps surprised me is how long it took. <laughs> when, when, when Danny as first mentioned this handbook, I was thinking it would be, you know, something we'd do in a year or possibly two. And then, you know, it took us a uh, almost four years I think from start to finish it was a huge endeavor um, and I learned a huge amount from not least from Danny and Sonia I mean working together as a team was a, a fantastic process I think it was um, um, it's taught me a huge amount and has been um, yeah a good a good exercise in collective leadership I think but um, yeah I, I guess the kind of in terms of learning is that that kind of how the critical issues are so cross-cutting and, and not just about power, but also about facilitation. You know, we don't think of facilitation as a core thing to uh, address in research. Well, we do as participatory researchers. And I think um, it comes up in the section on critical, um, on critical issues in participatory, in, in participatory research. And it comes up in so many of the chapters about how to do good risk facilitation, why for good facilitation is so important and really helps to think about it. And through all these different examples is why it's so important. And for researchers to be thoughtful about that and about their own positionality. Um, I'll stop there and pass it on. 
Uh, Danny, and, what, what did you learn? Well, um, maybe maybe the surprise thing was just how much was out there. So, I mean, in a sense, what I learned was about a whole bunch of methods I'd never even heard of, which was fantastic. Because in a sense, I mean, I think one of the exciting things about participatory research is that it's not rooted in the idea that here's the method, it's rigorous and robust if you follow it exactly um, how it's prescribed and at the end of it you get an answer. It's always been about find the right method to answer the question you're asking right now. And that often means you need multiple methods, different ones. You know, that um, there are methods which apply to the evaluation and monitoring and the learning stages of the process. There are methods which apply to opening up out an inquiry. There are methods which you can use online because actually right at this moment, you need to engage with people that are somewhere else and so on. So I think what's exciting is that there's just a greater repertoire, really. Um, Robert Chambers often talks about, you know, his witnessing of an explosion of research methods over the last 20 years. And I guess um, my surprise was just how extensive that was. So it comes back to what Joe said, when we started, we didn't know we were gonna have 70, 71 chapters, but it's like, you can't miss any of this stuff out because it's so important. Um, and if you're gonna to bring together a compilation of, you know, as much as possible, everything that's out there right now, and of course there are gaps, um, then you've got to include them. Yeah. Sonia, what surprised you? Well, first I want to reaffirm Joe's point about learning from our co-editor team and from each of the pers of the authors and co-authors in the different sections and chapters. I, it was like an amazing experience how much we learned through these four years. And I also want to reiterate Danny's point about the proliferation and the depth and breadth of, uh, the, of the, the practice that is happening out there. I want to add to that something that surprised me is the creativity. It's like how creative people have become or ha have the, the creative ways in which things have been developed is amazing. And I felt many times like I was like a little girl in a candy store wanting to really absorb and, 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 and taste each of these different pieces. And the, I was in awe of the creativity. But I really want to talk about the piece that surprised me the most is how processes um, in the North and processes in the South practices, thinking about participatory action research were quite different, had each their own language. And at the same time, there was like a convergence of the kinds of issues and concerns that people have about it, right? And this, what surprised me is that these were both emerging really very much from the context and groundings um, that are so different in the North and in the South and with the dynamics between North and South. And at the same time, there was the conversations happening across North and South that also enriched each other. So, you know, as an example, this whole idea of the extended epistemologies that we think of uh, as a North conversation um, and, you know, like the, the, the how it has become really very important to realize that there are different kinds of knowledges and that we have to figure out how do we generate and tap all those different kinds of knowledges um, is, is very parallel um, to a, a very critical sense of um, epistemology developing the South around the pluriversality and the decolonization of knowledge. So the language is very different, but this is all about the, the need for dialogue of knowledges, the need for uh, interrupting epistemic violence when the only uh, knowledge that gets to be legitimate is one that uh, to some extent takes away the voice of people who have knowledge on the ground because it doesn't come from legitimate scientific um, narratives. Um, and, and the idea of, uh, of um, extended epistemologies was very critical at, at its moment, right? And continues to be very critical and grounding. And so here are two ways of, of challenging the basic idea of, of uh, one single epistemology, but coming with very diverse understandings of what that means for the lived experience that people are having. That was very surprising to see it emerge um, in such an organic way. 
and in different moments, but with with similar issues at hand. And thanks, Sonia. Obviously, the book has a huge amount of content, two volumes, multiple chapters, multiple contributors. Danny, briefly, was there anything that you ended up leaving out? Well, um, we we left out um, some of the chapters that people started and never finished, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I think there were other things that we left out. I'm I'm just trying to reflect on that. Maybe Sonia, you you have a go, and then I'll I'll come back to that one. Um, yeah, thanks, Danny. Well, I, I think when you ask that question, Peter, what comes to mind for me is more what we fought to make sure that it didn't fall through the ground mm -hmm. because um, in, in many cases, people are busy working on the ground, doing the things that they care about and writing a chapter for a handbook. We cared about that, but for them, it was one more thing to do among many others in a social change context. And so for example, we worked very hard to make sure that we had an indigenous perspective not only in the various chapters um, of the how-to, which it, it is there, but we also wanted to make sure that it was there in, um, in the first part of the book, in the conceptual part that, that teaches us also an approach to research that's, that's very important. And um, it, it took a while to finally get something to jail. Um, it would have been easy to say, okay, I tried. But there was a sense of commitment that there were some things that nowadays, today, in the present time, have to be there, right? And that these, um, this is one example. There were several examples uh, like that that we wanted to make sure were there. And, and it was disappointing when, at some point, elements that we wanted to see didn't fall, fell through, right? Um, so we completely get it that this is not a completely overall taste of any possible issue that's important. But we tried our best to get as much as, as we could in there. And I, Joe, I don't know if you have other ideas uh, uh, before we go back to Danny. I don't know. Thanks, Sonia. Um, I might make the point that Danny was now going to remember, but um, um, that one thing about the handbook is that um, we have quite explicitly made it about participatory research and an affirmation of participatory risk research, which while we are looking at the challenges and critiquing how we have um, conducted the research in a particular context and thinking about our power and positionality and how those played out. At the same time, we're saying participatory research does something important and we're making an argument, we're making a strong case for it. We're not questioning and um, offering opportunities to kind of uh, challenge it. Um, so that's quite explicit. It's a, it's a handbook of particip participatory research. So we didn't look for contributions that would be trying to challenge or question um, these, this kind of approach or paradigm. Danny, I mean, did you want to add to that? That was the point I was going to make, but I, 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 think, that, I think that's it really, which is that um, in chapter two, we do look at the critiques of participatory research and in some detail, and there have been many over the years, um, and of course, some of the, the, the chapters are filled with people's self-reflections, you know, from their own work about what's working and what's not working and what they need to pay attention to and what are the power issues and the ethical issues. But in the end, the, the purpose of the book is to, is to give life to a form of research which we see as having come of age, if you like, having reached maturity, having been able to answer the ro robust questions which have been thrown at, at it, if you like, over the years. Um, so it isn't a book for the, the, the critiques, ultimately. It's a book which can say, and now here we have a critical mass of really detailed, profound thinking and learning, which we want to give to you. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's, that's, that's been quite central to our approach. Really, the last major question I had for the three of you is really about what difference 
you see this book can make by publishing it now. Obviously, participatory research is very strongly linked to social change and societal transformation. So as editors, what would you like to change as a result of publishing, publishing this book? And how can this knowledge be used to shape development thinking, which is a quest I think uh, many of us, including uh, IDS, we are very engaged in conversations around this at the moment. Well, I think going back to what Danny said earlier, I think what we would like to see, or I would like to see, is for participatory research as a broad um, as a broad paradigm, really, is to be recognised and central to for anybody who is trying to bring about change, and that includes policymakers. Um, people in, you know, ministries of defence and so on, think about bringing in people's experience and having them work through with you what, what are the appropriate things to do in order to bring about change. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, and I think because participatory research really, we're, we're looking at this, the book represents tools that people can use to help uh, to help um, shorten that distance between academic evidence-based knowledge and, and policy and practice to practitioner actions and active activist driven change. How do we bring those together so that we're really working and, co and co collaborating together to in, in a better way? That's what I'd like to see out of this book. Thanks, Joe. Sonia. Well, you know, I, I'm thinking that um, to starting with the place for where I am right now as an academic, which is my primary sphere of influence. I would want to say that while participatory action research has gained a lot of currency in lots of uh, domains and places, it, it pops up in lots of different places now. A book like this can actually bring a lot of legitimacy to it as a very important tool for researchers. It, 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 uh, if it becomes one of many tools and sometimes a preferred tool, sometimes a tool that you see that has an edge over some of the others uh, in the different academic uh, play, uh, realms. I think that's the beginning of an, of an important uh, change uh, for academia. I would also say that um, something that I would like to see happen is for people on the ground to understand how well positioned they are to do the research and, not, and, and how much they have to offer in terms of uh, researcher capacity, cap capability and experience in uh, working on their own stuff. And so that to some extent, it's also legitimate, legitimating a different kind of source of expertise that, uh, that would be also um, very, very important in terms of thinking about what does uh, creation of knowledge really is about in, in today's world and how it, it, important it is to help challenge other processes. And actually the, the last point that, that I wanna make is um, uh, in terms of the issue of legitimacy is that you know, we've, we face with the doing of the, of the handbook, the same contradictions that we face in this world with the systems that are holding it together. And so we've been very frustrated about the fact that this amazing handbook couldn't be prized better for people to use it at some at, at some level um, and uh, we're trying very hard and Danny has been a champion here in, in pushing Sage to try to figure out how we can make this accessible to a larger number of people but it is like a source of frustration at some level and and so to some extent part of what we need to do is to change those kinds of constraints that um, that uh, keep us from being able to move forward in, 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 many, in many ways, right? And so I don't, you know, Sage has been incredibly helpful, incredibly generous, and at the same time, it works within certain strictures. And, and, and it's interesting to see that and how we can continue to push, you know, pub, uh, publishing companies to make uh, work more accessible to other people who cannot, who don't have the means to access with the prices that are out there so yeah no i i was gonna say that um it links to your point about legitimacy sonia which is that i think um what i hope that this book will do is give participatory researchers confidence that there's a critical mass of uh 
of knowledge development, methodological development, um, which has reached a maturity now, which allows people to say, yes, I'm a participatory researcher and stand up confidently. Because I think, you know, there's been a sense in which um, participatory researchers have felt they had to defend themselves against the onslaught of traditional positive research, which is, you know, robust and generalizable and objective and all of those words that are thrown out, which actually don't make sense to us. And I think we can own different sorts of words, that it's intersubjective, and that's really important, you know, that it actually is rooted in real experience, that it's tested in action. And all of the other types of um, framings that we would want to bring to it, I think we now have a body of knowledge that is, is um, so comprehensive that it allows us to stand and say, yes, this is a really good way of doing things. In many contexts, it's much better than other ways of doing things. So, you know, stand tall and be proud of, of what we're doing here. And I guess ultimately, what we want to do is, is to make that small contribution that anything can make, we can only ever make a small contribution to the change that's needed in the world. And we'll probably never know what that is, as hopefully hundreds of people go off and do the hundreds of things that we never hear about, or maybe we hear just the, the seed of and, and get excited by. But I guess that's what I would hope for the book, that people just go and take it and make, make it into a reality which creates transformation. Yeah, and the people and students especially who are coming new to participatory research can make those connections between methods that appeal to them and the underpinnings, those people who trod the path all these years before and came up with these amazing ideas, how they can link methods that they might want to use today back to those and understand how and why and with what principles they were, they were um, designed and tested. And then that feeds into what Sonia and Danny were saying, the legitimacy of these, these approaches and these methods, that they are, they build on this great tradition and these amazing thinkers and then have exploded into all these different methods that then offer people a huge range of possibilities for adapting to particular to the particular contexts and um, and people that they want to work in and with to do good work and make small or bigger changes okay well thanks so much danny joe sonia this has been a really exciting and inspiring conservation, uh, conversation. And I know that the book is going to be a really important resource and a reference point for ideas and practice for an ever-growing community of participatory researchers on these huge global challenges that are universal and affect us all. So I see uh, a really wide audience and readership uh, around this, and I'm sure a lot of engagement will follow. So congratulations to you all and indeed to all the book's contributors on this launch. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share to help us spread the word. Do you have a great book we could feature in a future episode? Then get in touch on email at betweenthelines at ids.ac.uk.